Well, hello. My name is Ethan Hawk, and this is... Oh, Maya Hawk, and um, we're here with Letterboxd to talk about movies we've watched together over the years. Which, you know, I think when normal actor-director conversations on this subject happen, they're probably talking about movies they watched in prep. Our prep was Maya's entire life. Yeah, I mean, I think we really have to start this conversation about film and pay respects to A Bug's Life because that film, it is a kind of inspired by Seven Samurai, which inspired Mag 7. And Magnificent Seven was the movie I was shooting when Maya brought Flannery O'Connor's prayer journal to set. And it was long shoot and whole weeks were ruined with rainstorms. And I used to have to sit in my trailer for days on end. And Maya would come in and we'd talk and she would read the prayer journal out loud and we talk about it to each other and that's kind of where Wildcat might have been born and we have to give credit back to when she was four years old and I guess I think I had the VHS Maya of A Bug's Life. You had the VHS and I, I also think it's worth talking about how important it is and it's been in our life for people like the people at Pixar you know they do it extremely well but a lot of people have done it really well to make films that children and adults both find enjoyable and interesting and I think it's happening less and less these days there are fewer and fewer people who are doing it movies are getting extremely targeted toward their audience and not made in a way that is challenging and interesting and dynamic for adults and challenging and interesting and dynamic for young people also. And it's an invaluable gift. I have the privilege of working on Inside Out 2 right now. And if you find a movie like Inside Out 1, where like adults and kids can sit together and all cry about this exploration of the inner life, which also ties back to Wildcat because that's what we try to do with that movie is explore the inner life. And just how important that is as an offering that you can make to families and people around the world if you make a movie that does that. It's not just true for family films, it's also true for like romances. So many movies feel like it's this romantic film has a female gaze, this film has a male gaze, this is for a 16 year old boy, this is, whereas a lot of the movies that I really grew up on, even take a movie like One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest or one of these g staggering geniuses, you can enjoy that movie at 15 and you can enjoy that movie at 55 in very different ways. The next thing I would want to shout out is Chelsea Cinemas because we lived at the Chelsea Hotel for a, a long time and I'm, I'm having trouble remembering an exact movie that we went to go see there because we went so much. But we lived right down the street from it and we went all the time and we would play this video game called Arctic, Arctic Thunder there and we would go see movies together a lot. I have so many memories of going up and down the escalator and playing Arctic Thunder and your brother would fall asleep. Then I would go back there at night and see other grown up movies. You, you know what I mean? So it's just like a, a giant blur. We had a great few years. There's a movie theater and another one in New York called the Film Forum, which has a great program for kids at 11 o'clock on Sunday. Instead of taking the kids to church, they play classic films. You know, you can go see Buster Keaton and sometimes they have Charlie Chaplin with live piano or we go see Iron Giant or Never Ending Story or Goonies. Or remember we went to see National Velvet with Liz Taylor. I love sharing movies and, and Maya's like the most fun person to go see a movie with because you never know what she's gonna like and what she's not gonna like. You never know what she's gonna say about afterwards, which actor she's gonna be in love with, somebody who gave a famous great performance that she thinks is terrible. And she's had that forever. I remember I was gonna jump in with one of the high points of my life was I had this movie that meant the world to me was Francis Ford Coppola's The Outsiders, which like I was 14 when that came out. And then it got re-released when Maya was 14. And I remember taking you to the movies to see they, they did the director's cut. It's like 15 minutes longer. I remember Maya, you were so funny. It's like, she walked out and she's like, now I understand the way you dress. <laughs> I forgot that I said that, but it's totally true. And now, since then, is the way I dress. But um, yeah, that was a, that was a great one. I was also remembering what was the video store called that was across the street from our house? Allen's Alley. Allen's Alley, of course. Um, and we used to go there all the time. And I'm, I just a memory was coming to me of 
forgive me for saying this, but The Professional is the name of the movie of Natalie Portman's first film, yes? I don't know if it was her first film, but that's the word she did with Luc Besson, and yeah. I remember, I'm just moving forward a little further in time, I think I was uh, a freshman in high school, and you recommended that me and my friend rent that movie um, and watch it at a sleepover, and it rocked our socks off. Alvin's Alley was still open and existing, and we walked down the street, and I mean, this is mostly an ad now for just like, please don't get rid of all the video stores and movie theaters, please. But we walked down the street and we went and rented The Professional and we brought it back. And it was just a, an electrifying performance by a young Natalie that was so in, inspiring at the time and so exciting to watch. Do you remember why you recommended that film, Dad? Mostly because I, I, I thought that you would love Natalie Portman in it. And it's just a really smart genre movie. A lot of people try to make smart genre movies, but Luc Besson at his best, he plays with all these, all this iconography in such an intelligent way. And um, that movie's just so watchable. And I, I didn't want to be the dad who recommended movies you don't like, which is usually what parents do. Like, you know, I really want you to watch Winter Light. Okay, you know. The professional all of a sudden thinking about it is reminding me of another important movie to us is Paper Moon. Very different movie, but similar like relationship in some ways. Two great juvenile performances, Tatum O'Neill and Natalie Portman. And the Paper Moon was is a great father-daughter story, you know, so we enjoyed the hell out of that. Just some of those scenes also of a juvenile performance where a young person is really working, working so hard to impersonate an adult too. And to to show how how much they could keep up with the adult world, which I I don't know, I feel like I was really going through that at the time that you showed me those movies. A deep longing for adulthood. And of course, like as soon as you become an adult, you have this longing for childhood. But I was really going through that at the time that you picked out those films for me to watch and it was always helps to look at something from a third person point of view. My favorite movie, Dad, you showed to me, Altman's Nashville. It's, it's my favorite movie. I, I talk about it all the time. I have seen it, I think six or seven times and for people who have seen Nashville, they know that that is a strange choice. Like it's a, it's a, it's an odd movie. It's a long movie and it's very poetic and quilted. It's all these kind of different individual moments and not very plot oriented. And it's an odd movie to have watched this many times, but every time I watch it, I've seen it in revival houses on the big screen. I've seen it at, in a, at a home movie theater. I've seen it on my computer. And every time I've watched it, I've gained something different from it. I'm very, very grateful to have been shown it. I think it's really, uh, shape me in a major way. Yeah, it has to be one of the, you know, my top five movies of all time. And there's something about Altman. He does something that almost nobody else can do. A few people can do it. I think Richard Linklater can do it, which is embrace some of the tools of theater without ever becoming theatrical and remain cinematic. Meaning the actors are inhabiting such real spaces with long scenes where you're allowed to observe body language and you don't feel uh, manipulated. You feel like you're watching life the kind of way why I'm gonna talk about the theater, like what Stanislavski and Chekhov were trying to accomplish where we're just gonna really hold a mirror up to nature. There's such a love of humanity. Even when people are bad and ugly, there's love for them. And there's so many movies that are so cynical about bad people or people who don't behave right. And he's just a scientist. You feel like he's just a scientist dropped into Nashville and he's seeing it all. And I, we needed to be a bit of a scientist with Flannery where we're not trying to discern for you whether she's a good person or a bad person, whether she's worthy of your time or not. She's just worthy of this movie. That's all we've determined. One other kind of irrelevant thing I would say about Nashville that I think about all the time is the sound design on that film. You hear multiple conversations happening at once in many scenes. And as an actor, I'm so often on set and you do a take and it's great and alive and people are talking over each other and it's amazing. And then you get a note and someone goes, hey, just for sound, can we do a take where you don't overlap at all, you know, will you stop overlapping your lines? Because, and I always think to myself, well, in Nashville they overlapped and I could understand every word. Like, what What do you mean? You need me to finish my sentence before the other person starts talking? That's not what humans do. I know the computer glitches when we do it and we still have to overlap each other. Exactly, and, and, and I love 
the way that Altman built that world and, and it, it gives me the power of indignance every time someone tells me not to let another actor cut me off or cut someone off because because he did it so beautifully in that film. You are truly my child. I mean, I, my friends, if you ever want to see me lose my temper, put me with a sound man because I I, I I go bananas and I end up talking about Altman all the time. And most sound men hate that movie, by the way, <laughs> for precisely this reason. But I think it sounds amazing. And I, I think I remember reading about I can't remember exactly what it was that was invented for that movie, but the sound design of it was a huge part of Altman's goal in making it. And I, I think that like the personal wires where each person was wired, I think he would wire the crowd scenes. Yeah, he took he took the he took the radio mic to a new level that had never been taken before. He would get everybody with a radio mic on him and he would play with the levels later. And that's what was so wonderful for the actors is you didn't know whether the camera was on you or not which gives people so much freedom. Even, you know, when I was doing that Newman documentary, he was asking Newman to work that way, who had never worked that way, but he ended up loving it. You know, so there's tons of speeches in uh, Buffalo Bill that are just Newman improvising, and he'd never done that in his life. It's amazing when you don't know whether or not the camera's on you, and it, and it does add a theatrical spirit to it. And it is so different than when you're filming, you're like, all right, here's your coverage, here's your coverage, here's the two shot, and we're just, you know, we're gonna come around this way. On Wes's set, you wouldn't think this, but I weirdly, and when we were working in Asteroid City, there were a lot of moments where you didn't know whether or not the camera was on you. They were so far away. You know, he builds these whole worlds, these environments and like, a, you know, a town you can dwell in and the camera is so far away and you don't know what lens is on or how it's moving and, and you're shooting on film. So it's not like you can go look at the monitor and you don't know if you're being filmed or not. So you're really living in the world and the stage that's been built. And it's such a great experience. And, and it really frees you from the navel gazing. Oh, how do I look here? Do I look good standing this way? Do I look good when I stand that way? Oh, you're shooting from this angle. I should turn my head down a little bit. You know, it just completely liberates you from that. The funny thing about when I first heard about this letterbox interviews, we had such an interesting experience getting ready for Wildcat because Maya had her wisdom teeth pulled out and came back to the house and stayed with us for a few days to recover from her giant sore mouth. And she was heavily drugged up in the best captive audience. I mean, she just was on the couch for three days. She wanted to watch anything. It didn't matter how long it was. It didn't matter how weird it was. And we had so much fun. We watched Coal Miner's Daughter because like, if you're gonna embark on a biopic, I don't know, Sissy SpaceX. That's the best of all time. I mean, at least the best music biopic of all time. Definitely, which I always like to say is a very low bar. Most of the music biopics are pretty bad. But we also watched Gene Campion's An Angel at My Table. And I say that because like Raging Bull, it's a biopic, but it's not a biopic. It's a movie about a person that is a really deep and significant person, whether we're talking about Janet Frame or Jake LaMotta, they're excellent, deeply mysterious films full of nuance and brilliant performances. And you don't need to know who either one of them is to enjoy the film. Like I had no idea who Janet Frame was before we watched Angel at My Table, but now I do, but really as a character in that story, more than I, I know her as a writer, which I think is even cool to have a movie be that true to life is completely freed from its reputation as a biopic. And then as a filmmaker, it's such a fun movie to study because it's one of those strange examples where the performances, the photography, the music, and the writing and the production design are all one thing. It's like impossible to separate them. The whole event of the movie is working towards something bigger than the sum of its parts. And then I also, I couldn't believe I had Maya. So she was like, what do you want to watch next? I was like, let's do a double feature of Days of Heaven and Badlands. She's like, okay, great. Let's get another bowl of popcorn. And then, you know, and, and you would have a smoothie. I would eat the popcorn. I don't know. I mean, do you remember watching Days of Heaven was so beautiful. You remember that? It's so beautiful and mysterious. And to watch Sam Shepard act, you know, I mean, in my own life, and I feel like you are too, I'm a student of people who try to do more than one thing at once in their life. And some people do it successfully and some people fail at it. But what it shows to me, I feel like the question I get asked the most is like, what's more important to you, acting or music? What do you like doing more? What's more? 
And it's all the same spirit. You know, I, I love how Joni Mitchell talks about her painting. Like my songwriting is painting and my painting is song, like it's, it's, it all comes from the same well in me. It's just different ways of expressing myself. And, and to get to watch Sam Shepard act in that movie and also just the exquisite beauty of it. The cinematography in The Days of Heaven is just overwhelming and the care put into the shots of getting the wind blowing in the fields and people walking through them and you feel like you're there because of the way that it's a visual painting around you. The use of voiceover, I knew we were about to make a movie that had a tremendous amount of voiceover and voiceover can ruin a film, it can be a crutch, or it can make a film. In Days of Heaven, her voice and the writing is so beautiful. I remember when I was doing First Reform, Paul Schrader would talk a lot about the power of VO when it's used right. You know, it's a cheat if you're furthering the plot with VO, but if the VO is inviting you into an internal experience, it can be really magical. And, and, and um, Days of Heaven is a perfect example of that. Amadeus, I mean, it, it's hard to even call it a biopic. I mean, technically, I guess it is, but it's just a staggering masterpiece. I feel like that's how what happens with some biopics, like the ones we're talking about, become movies in and of themselves. And some don't. Some are so attached to the reputation of the thing they're inspired by. You know, there's movies that are inspired by historical events that are in the, in the same way to me. Sometimes that kind of movie is only interesting if you know the history and you're curious about the history. And sometimes it's interesting because it's a great film. We had no interest when we were making Wildcat really in making a biopic. We were interested in telling a story about imagination, faith and reality and, and America and, and femininity, I guess. We saw an opportunity in the facts of Flannery's life to achieve that goal. But I think that in the biopics that I like the most, there's clearly a personal thesis or a personal reflection that the writer and the director and the performers are having on themselves and their world that goes beyond the facts of the story they're trying to tell. Yeah, I mean, like, you don't watch Raging Bull and think Scorsese's trying to teach you about Jake LaMotta. He's expressing his inner fighter with Jake LaMotta's life, and it becomes powerful on multi-tiers. Pretty much my whole adult life, the Coen brothers have been making movies and been wildly respected and heralded. And I go see all their movies and I always like them. And when I was setting out to make this movie, I found I thought about them a lot, how smart they are. I don't think I showed it to you, Maya, but I, I, I watched a couple times this movie, A Serious Man, which is a lesser seen Coen Brothers movie. They're so smart. You know, when we would describe this movie, hey, you, we're gonna make a movie about a girl, di young woman dying of lupus who really wants to be a writer, but she fails constantly and she's really unlikable and she lives in the Jim Crow South and, um, doesn't really deal with racism. Think it's a great idea? The, the answer is no. But I, I, I kept thinking about, I bet the Coen brothers would know what to do with Flannery O'Connor. Like she was so multi-dimensional as an artist. The aspiration for excellence was at such a high pitch. I found myself really thinking about their filmmaking and how much I, I learned from it and how indebted to I am. They managed to be both deeply cinematic and make mainstream movies that can play at a mall. It's remarkable. When I was younger, sometimes we, we would paint together, just kind of free paint and we'd call them masterpieces. And sometimes they all turned completely brown. You know, we would try, we'd try not to paint any actual objects. You know, like it wasn't a house or a flower. It was just color on the page. They were not masterpieces, but that's what we, we called them. But we both have an inclination toward finding the, beauty in free form expression. And Flannery is a razor blade. Like if you look at her notes and the way she edited in the drafts of her stories and even in you know some of the speeches that are in our film about how her own creative process and how she liked to do it and how she thought about it and it, it, she's extremely sharp. And we both realized that we had to find a way to make this movie and, and not try to make a masterpiece, not try to discover it slowly from washing colors around, but try to work in her way with a razor blade. And it was a wonderful challenge, I think, for, for both of us that we both grew from a lot. And I, I think whether or not anyone likes biopics or doesn't like biopics, one of the huge benefits of them are if you engage with the way that an artist works, 
in order to make art about them, you can learn a lot about how to become better. They're great teachers. Um, and, and I feel extremely educated by them. Me too. It's, it's, it's a form meets content thing. You know, when I was making this film, Blaze, about Blaze Foley, Blaze was a big guy. He was messy. He was sloppy. He was inadvertent. And it was very fun to try to match him in that. We, we shot the movie very simply, one lens. We let actors improvise. And I kind of made the movie in the editing room. We created this world, and then I tried to shape it in the editing room. With this movie, it was entirely opposite. We, we had to be so much more disciplined. I love what you just said, Maya, it's so true. I had to teach my brain to work differently because she's just not a sloppy person at all. If you're really gonna make a movie about her, you have to think like her. The final edit looks a great deal like the script. You know, um, and there were many, many drafts of the script. And I don't really know if we have more than one cut scene. We made the movie that we set out to make. We, we obsessed on the script. I knew we didn't have much money and I thought every deleted scene is a failure because we don't have enough money to make the movie. So if we're spending money on stuff that's gonna be on the editing room floor, it's a disaster. I even sent the script to the editor before we started filming to say, all right, Picture this whole movie shot perfectly. We know it's seven minutes too long. What are the first seven minutes we cut? And he came back, well, I think this scene might not go. And he's like, cut it. And then we reworked the script to make sure we didn't need it. It was wonderful to try to work that disciplined.